good afternoon everybody uh so happy to have all of you back here with us again uh, we did a lot of these uh, webinars and these kind of meets and chats uh, last year and uh, it's happy to be back together and see everybody today uh, we have an interesting session we have uh, a book release for the butterflies of delhi it's a initiative by shantanu and varsha they worked hard on it to get the ebook ready so as the butterfly season has started in uh, north india they can people can get their get this book and uh, have a easy time uh, identifying species this year around them so uh, i think it's a good thing that such books more and more such books can be written and been brought to people the more people know about it uh, about butterflies the better it is uh, it'll help uh, scientists researchers with their conservation work it'll help in the general uh, you know well being of these butterflies if we have a armed uh, citizenry which is armed with knowledge will actually drive change so with that i would like to open it up for shantanu as i said uh, shantanu has been working on butterflies of delhi for the past 5 to 6 years and he's done extensive surveys and uh, photography in delhi and uh, uh, i just leave it up to him now to explain the circumstances of the book and why and how we can get our hands on it so shantanu the floor is yours yeah thank you thank you thank you soel and uh, thank you for the lovely introduction also so guys you see the book cover in front of you uh, how this book came about is a small story it's like uh, nikhil used to send me a couple of photos once in a while of butterflies asking for identification and one day he said that why didn't you write something for us like people who are incidental butterflies were not like basically into butterflying they are mostly into birding or something else take shots of butterflies and what are the ideas so that set up a chain of thought to flip the switch so i called up my friend varsha and asked her which we should we she be able to help and would she be like him to help she stays in mumbai so well, she agreed this project got started there were two major part of the project one was bringing the number of butterflies from 110 plus that is the delhi list to something around 50 or 60 why i'll come to that and the second part uh, was uh, trying to keep the language uh, simple a beginners guide it says and a beginners guide is what it is the uh, the subtitle is common butterflies of delhi and see are a beginners guide right so let me tell you about something a little bit about myself i am not an expert i am not an expert in butterfly i am not an expert in writing but there is only one thing i am an expert of and i have been an expert for long almost all my life and i can bet that i am a bigger expert than all of you guys i am an expert at being a beginner <laughs> so from, from that point of view okay hima i am trying to speak up let's see from that point of view i have tried to get this book on it is on delhi ncr the common butterflies of delhi ncr would put or somewhat be common for almost all cities excepting couple here and there and uh, this this is an ebook this is an ebook uh, with a pdf format fully searchable you can do a control f and search on butterflies so i would like you people to have this in your mobile while you are going on butterflying so that you can you know look up to it uh, we have kept the font a little bit bigger so that it's easy to you know refer to this book and uh, okay the question is how do you get a hold of this book people who have come in here through filling up their google form i have their email ids i will we will send out a mailer giving the download link for the rest i will be putting up a download link in the chat shortly and uh, in the same page if you can take a, take a copy of this page in front of you you would find a qr code there you can scan that qr and get a download this is an ebook 
it is subject to many changes in future betterment so i would like you guys to have your suggestions flowing in so that we can you know work on the suggestions i would uh, thank sohel for writing a forward a beautiful forward to it i would like to thank all all the contributors of photographs and especially my my co-author varsha for this beautiful design as well as some paintings this cover itself is a painting of a plain tiger which looks like a photograph and yeah yeah i hope this book is put to use you guys like it love it and yeah and 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 in future i would like to bring out uh, you know books like this with all your help for all the almost all cities of india so why not common butterflies of calcutta chennai some other places thane you know let let's see what the future holds over to you sohel so uh, great great to hear from you shantanu and uh, uh, i think inspirational for all of us that you call yourself a beginner and you've come out with a book which uh, Uh, will help beginners so uh, it's generally my interest area of interest that uh, how can we reach uh, to more and more people and uh, how the message of conservation of butterflies can reach out to a wider audience uh, as many people as we have so uh, shantanu i think uh, it'll be great to great your book will be a great addition and i think uh, uh, i would urge people from delhi who are not just butterflyers who go out birding or you know gardening they should all get grab this book and uh, get a copy and start using it uh, i've used it on my cell phone and uh, i must say I, i i like it right especially the searchable feature so uh, with that thank you shantanu uh, i'm sure everybody would enjoy this book uh, let's move on to our main session today this is uh, again uh, my privilege to have peter smatechek with us uh, peter has uh, accepted this invitation to be part of uh, this today's chat and uh, he's extensively worked all over india on butterflies he needs no introduction uh, he's worked in delhi he if one of the first book on butterflies of delhi i have a very old copy by kalpik uh, was written by peter so uh, it's app that we have him here today um, he's here to answer our questions like he always does he's, a, he's been a great uh, teacher to me also so uh, i've been asking him questions since the first day i met him um, over the food that he was preparing for me so uh, it's been a relationship that's gone on like that and uh, i hope you guys also find it constructive we are going to go through uh, on the registration form we have had questions uh, by the participants uh, i'm going to just uh, call in peter and uh, uh, ask him a few general questions over the few themes that people want covered and then we can go on to specific questions so uh, uh, like you all know peter is joining us from bhimtal he uh, has been instrumental in uh, actually documenting uh, butterflies of india and has uh, been spearheading a lot of projects via his students that he's trained over the years uh, people especially go to bhimtal to learn basics and advanced stuff in butterflying he runs a, a butterfly research center there and i urge everyone uh, if you haven't please do go visit uh, like i've already said his the food is really good and i haven't been for two years and i'm missing missing the food so peter uh, without wasting any more time uh, how are you fine thank you and uh, how is everything in bimtal i hope every this corona situation is not too bad and people are coping like everywhere else mm, it's as bad as anywhere else no better it just started to rain so i'd better get back in my dabba so thank you for the introduction yeah and uh, shantanu um, here's a clap for your book and i hope it's it's very useful to very many people and so far as your idea for having it for different indian cities is concerned it's a very good idea all you have to do is change the cover 
yes 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 varsha you can start designing covers already <laughs> yeah, that'll, be, that'll be a huge job done already if all the covers are in but the great thing about the book peter is that he uh, shantanu uh, has reached out to a wider community and uh, uh, from information about Sorry, butterflies about to um, that'll be easy all have been sourced from the community so no it's got hung hello you breaking up a little bit peter did i do something now you're good hello yeah peter we can hear you i've gone and done something hello so so well in the meanwhile i think you need to pin peter and you on the Anthony, thing because hello have i done something wrong no 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 peter we can hear you can you hear us um shall i go back and come back again can you hear us can you hear us hello peter we can hear you he cannot hear us can't hear you we have to call him hello as he switched off speaker no uh, it was I'll, I'll leave it. Sure, Peter. Ah, uh, the connection from Bhimtal is patchy. So, guys, Peter will be here in two, a couple of minutes only. He's uh, re-logging back. Please bear with us for the time being. So, yeah, Shantanu, you were saying uh, about pinning somebody. Peter, Peter, and yourself, because we are seeing so many people on the speakers. Oh, I am only seeing me. It's not pretty. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, Peter's back. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I got a call from someone, and that cut everything out. <sighs> Great to have you back. Yeah, thank you yeah. very much. Good to be back. I'm going yes. to sit here on the rock and not move from now, here. Now, now you can pin Peter. So well, huh? no, no, not you. So well, you can pin Peter now. I can't pin him for a reason. Get some flowers in. There, yeah. Shall sure, let's start? Yes, I'm so sorry. Yeah, Peter, you were saying something about Chandra's book. That's where we. I was I was saying that uh, oh that, that means that was not an expression of surprise in your face that you got to, the the thing got hung. What I was suggesting is Shantanu can was talking about putting out this book for for all Indian cities, and I was saying that all you need to do is change the cover. So once yeah. I can get cracking and and just design a bunch of covers, the content can remain the same because the same butterflies are found all over India. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But, you yeah, know, you need to do anything except change the cover. <laughs> yeah. Don't let the cat out of the bag. <laughs> yeah, but like I was saying, uh, uh, it's great that uh, Shantanu, even if he goes changing covers into these cities, it'll be great to connect with people there. Definitely, and, it's useful. Yeah, that that that'll be useful like that. Yes, yes. This, um, um, there's nothing negative in what I'm saying. It's, it's very. He's put. He's made a one size fits all book. Yes. It's just yes. change the cover, and it works everywhere. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, uh, Peter, let me start out uh, with the questions people had, and yes. uh, uh, the first one, which I also always uh, ask you and always want to know, is uh, your love for butterflies. What actually fascinates you about butterflies? I know you don't like the question, and I wouldn't have asked you if it wasn't one of part of the questions people have sent. So, what? fascinates you about butterflies i really don't know mm -hmm. i don't like butterflies i don't like the skippers so i stay away from them 
<laughs> so the others is okay. See, the skippers, the problem is this, that you have to dissect it to know what it is. So either you have a complete butterfly or you have a dissected one, which you know. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So you have a complete, well-identified one. So I don't like that. And uh, as for the rest, yes, it's, it's nice. It's, I really don't know. I really don't know what, what, uh, what uh, drives me to it. Yeah, the thing, uh, there's the, a major factor was having a butterfly collection at home in childhood. My dad had the, the walls of his room full of butterflies and the talk at table was always about butterflies. So, uh, well, it affected one, doesn't it? Yes, yes, it does. And I also stumble with this question, Peter. Huh. But, uh, and the more I think about it, I come to a conclusion that uh, I just like being outside. You know, yeah. It just comes from that. Butterflies is a subject. I can spend time just, you know, looking at butterflies outside otherwise i'm just crammed in a yes uh, and and butterflies are active on in beautiful weather so that's that's, a, that's another very very good thing on yeah. a crowd, cloudy rainy day you won't have butterflies right so you stay indoors that day if it's a beautiful day there's a reason to go out let's go and look at some butterflies right sure so, sure yeah exactly exactly and uh, yeah I, I guess that winds this question up let's get to the more interesting ones sure so uh one that I would like to know uh, personally is uh, about your experience in uh, Delhi on butterflies. You wrote a book. Uh, I still use that book. Uh, very useful information in it about LHPs and uh, some areas where their old records have been mentioned. Uh, how was Delhi for you in terms of butterflies? I know people don't like it. There are lots of butterflies in Arunachal Pradesh. There are lots of butterflies in Western Ghats, Delhi, sparse, semi-arid. But I personally enjoy the simplicity of getting into butterflies in Delhi. See, each area has its own specialties. And if there are few or there are lots in Arunachal, what happens is you get fed up with butterflies. You see so many of them that a stage comes on the third day where you say, I'm not interested anymore. You just, it, you get, you know, flooded by data sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, you asking about the Delhi book, no? So uh, Ashish Kothari of Kalprik, she asked me to write a book. So I had uh, uh, written a book on Indian butterflies before that, but unfortunately there were 600 photographs, so nobody wanted to undertake the cost of writing that. We would have had a very good book in the early 1990s. And uh, they were, I had insisted that all, the upper and underside of everything was to be illustrated and that involved 600 slides. And to make separations of that was too expensive, so that book was never published. And Ashish got to hear about it by, by, by somehow or the other, in conversation or from somebody or something. And um, then he asked me to write a book on butterflies, I had the photographs. So I said, yeah, sure, I'll put it together. There were some people who had worked before. There was somebody in the 1940s who did an unreliable paper. But uh, Roger Ashton in 1972, he did a good paper on Delhi butterflies. And then Julian Donahue had worked a lot in the 70s. So their papers were very good reference material. And I really didn't survey Delhi very much myself, except when rarely I used to go down. And uh, so I put together this book and I gave Ashish the, the slides and uh, it was too expensive for him also. So then he said, oh, could you do illustrations? And then I rushed through those terrible illustrations in a hurry. But uh, at the back of the book, there are a bunch of, of uh, slides. Those were for the blues. So for the blues, I insisted, I told Ashish that there has to be photographs. I can't do, you know, convincing drawings of these. So, yeah. So that's why at the back, you, for, the, for the blues, upper sides, undersides at the time, that's how my original book was planned. Up, male, female, underside, male, female, underside. So there's no confusion whatsoever. And uh, the, so for that, he did the separations. But for the rest, I, I, I admit they're terrible drawings, but I did them in a, in a hurry. And uh, then subsequently, uh, I found the large cabbage white in Delhi. And since I had already uh, figured out what uh, is known and what is not known, so the most important thing for, for making findings is to have a knowledge base. So once you know what is going on in Delhi, and then you see anything new, then ah, yeah, this is new, this is new. So, you know, that, like Shantanu is now doing with the, with the book, there's a, he's a putting a baseline. And as you said, the more people we have who know about this thing, the more people there will be to raise a voice when something goes wrong. Isn't it? True, exactly, exactly. And that's... So, 
what we are I, heading towards something going wrong no i'll it's some much has already gone wrong i'll i'll take this opportunity to branch off into something else sure and that is worldwide in the 1970s a uh, trend started where butterfly collecting suddenly became a very bad thing and you were looked at as a criminal you know oh he's a killer oh he's destroying the environment oh he's killing these poor innocent little things and um, often oh he's selling them so i by chance i came across a book called the pursuit of butterflies uh-huh. i forget the author of hand so he's an he's an englishman who worked on british butterflies and he mentioned that in 1976 19 you see in some years you have a flood of butterflies and in other years you have few we don't really understand what happens it's something to do with the climate or um not necessarily the climate but it could be that the parasitic the parasites that keep the population down they didn't work out something went wrong for them so the butterfly population explodes so 1976 was a year like that and britain was flooded with butterflies europe was flooded with butterflies i can't remember that um, it happened in india in 1976 i was keeping a watch but over here we didn't have a flood of butterflies in europe it happened so uh, everybody is going out collecting butterflies you old so let Pardon? me let me let me stop you uh, matthew oats uh, is the what's yeah, matthew you can just mention it yeah 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 talks, so yeah. Um, um so in that thing in that book matthew wrote that in 1976 he and a friend of his went to look for a blue in some downs downs meaning uh, rolling grassy hillocks so they went to look for this particular chalk hill blue or something and um somebody saw them and uh, tamasha started and somebody wrote a letter to the times newspaper talking about how bad it was and then there was suddenly a flood of 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 letters and uh, um uh, so suddenly uh, he said after that the butterfly collectors either either stopped collecting they went abroad they went to commercial to start buying things or they went uh, they went to bird watching so butterfly collecting stopped effectively after 1976 and the pressure was kept up and in 1981 a law was enacted in britain saying banning the collection of insects without permission and um, in nine, so this is the background to what was and ever since then you know if you seen with the net then ho oh, ho oh, you're a very bad fellow uh-huh. then it turned out that there's a german uh, group of uh, individuals like us you know non affiliated they have a krefeld nat- nature club in krefeld and they had been using uh, malay straps malay straps are large open mouth cloth bags which you put up on a windy place and the flying some flying insects get in, into that and it leads the the cloth bag leads into a killing jar so whatever flies into the trap gets into the killing jar and is collected so you come once in 24 hours or every 12 hours or something and see what's come so these chaps they collected uh, in 30 protected areas in germany they could co- set up these malaise traps every year and they collected for 30 years but they didn't have the expertise to identify all that they had collected all the different insects but what they did by weight they preserved everything in alcohol and when they weighed it you must have heard of this uh, 30 years later in 2015 they started in 1986 and in 2015 they they weighed these things and by weight it turned out insect populations in those protected areas had dropped by 78% that's so, where the insect apocalypse thing comes from yes and then it turned out that there were no officially funded government projects anywhere in the world monitoring insect populations over a long period and it, they just stayed away from that topic there were no funds available for that nothing so how come this happened what is this chiming in of of you know the 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 uh, thing against collecting and the drop in insect population suddenly then it turns out that in 1974 your insecticide had been invented by Monsanto. what is now here and was at that time Monsanto what was that insecticide called uh, the most widely sold insecticide in a in a commercial name called roundup so when they invented that they realized it's a, it's a white it's a weed killer so they use it as sprays and all that it has now been banned in kerala and in several european countries and all 
And so this, this letter to the times and so on and so forth, this was a marketing strategy because they realized that the people who were the, the butterfly collectors were the monitors. They would be the first people to raise an alarm and say something is going wrong. The butterflies are dying out. So there's, there's, it's worth investigating that. And when I, when I put this, uh, some people will call it a conspiracy theory, but the facts fit too well. Uh, what is the name of that uh, insecticide? I forget. It's DDT. DDT. Well, not DDT. Not DDT. This is another one. It's, it's round, marketed as Roundup. Uh, it'll come back to me. I'll, I'll, now we will have Roundup ready, uh, you know, uh, grain and everything. Uh, is grain this, and, this, inside this, uh, this uh, chemical is the reason for your glucose. Is it glyphosate? Exactly, glyphosate. That is the reason for your, your gluten intolerance. Gluten intolerance is a, something that came up in the 1990s. And that is when glyphosate was used to spray the fields for harvest, which were going to be harvested. So just before, you see what happens in the large um, kilometer long prairies in the fields, big, big time fields, which are harvested with combined harvesters. The grain does not ripen evenly. So some plants are still green, some plants are ready to shed their grain. So what they do before harvesting, they sp spray the fields with glyphosate that kills the plants and these plants in dying, they extrude the seed. And then the combined harvesters run and can harvest the whole thing. And after that, they're collected and nobody washes that grain. And so when it's made into flour, you eat the glyphosate and the symptoms of gluten poisoning are actually glyphosate poisoning. Okay, the gluten intolerance drama. So anyway, it, the, so this is a case where butterfly collectors were put down because they would have raised the alarm. When you talk about creating an arm of a knowledge, knowledgeable army of people who can raise the voices, there was a thing, but you see they were circumvented by a very well-planned campaign. And uh, so they that, were- that leads, that leads me into this very important point here that you're mentioning here about how uh, uh, the collectors who were the monitors were turned into a pariah and it Grim turned into a thing you shouldn't be doing. And uh, uh, like I know personally, you know, uh, uh, rearing caterpillars, not just for science, for a small kid, a eight year old kid is a fascinating way, you know, for him to enter, uh, just enter the world of nature, you know, get a glimpse of how magical it is. And uh, uh, slowly by pushing people into malls and pushing people into, you know, uh, more commercial things, uh, our role as monitors has disappeared. Our, our, so, our, our role as, as a part of nature has been negated. We are not allowed to be part of nature. Nature is something different. Humans are something different. And as the rest that you say. So, uh, uh, leading to my next question, this is related to this only. Uh, lots of people asked, how can they help? Is, are they... Can they even do anything? Can people like me uh, with just uh, interest in gardening, looking at butterflies, uh, normal citizens, can they even do anything about, uh, about this, about conserving uh, butterflies? What should be done? What can be done? What are your ideas on that? Uh, we live in one of the very few democracies in the world. True. In, in India, we have anybody can become a chief minister, anybody can become a prime minister. You can start a party, a political party. If you get enough votes, you'll come to power. As the recent, uh, as the recent uh, elections demonstrated, no, no party has huge clout which can influence elections, blah, blah, blah. Right? So in, in this circumstance, um, we, the citizens, are king of our country. The government is not the king, the government are public servants. The politicians are our elected representatives. We are the kings. So how can you say that we can't make a difference? Yeah, I have, but, 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 but people get muddled with this thing, with politics, with one side, the other side. How can we uh, focus our energies towards a common goal of, you know, having a better future for our uh, kids? First, we have to recognize the fact that we are the owners of our country. We are the Maliks. Oh. And an owner is, being an owner of something is a 24 by 7 job. 
a servant can leave at five o'clock and go to sleep and forget about his job and come back at nine o'clock the next day and you know start again. But an owner has to be there on the job twenty four seven. So and an owner has to have knowledge. So these are the two things that we citizens require. We have to have knowledge not only of our constitution and the laws, but also of all things that affect our life and the future generations because we have to supervise what happens in this country, isn't it? Oh yes, yes, yes. Oh, in that, in that yeah. vein, uh, there has been a, a great groundswell uh, in Delhi. People are getting uh, into butterflies. They're wanting to know uh, about new records. They're wanting to. uh know about uh, writing papers getting that data out there to the general scientific community uh and uh, uh much more than that people are really interested in doing something around their houses you know build habitats yes. uh put a few host plants try and invite a few butterflies to you know lay their eggs and complete their life cycle near them i think it's a great uh great way uh, uh, for people to you know find a connection and uh, hopefully take that connection forward what are your ideas about uh, making butterflies habitats and uh, how easy or tough is it if you want to breed exotic things you have to create a habitat if you want to be kind to natives you just have to be kind to them nothing more you have to give them space so uh getting to know about native plants because yes. native plants have a long evolutionary relationship with the local butterflies around your area so yes. uh, uh having knowledge of local butterflies native plants and combining them together yes. into a small terrace garden would also work wouldn't it and you see the most important thing when i say give them space what i mean is that uh, when you see the leaves of your pot plant being eaten by caterpillars don't kill the caterpillars please <laughs> give them space the plant will regrow leaves that's a don't very important break your heart about the, the the insects eating up my beautiful plant you have to give them space isn't it it's their huh? it's their part too yes yeah you have to as much as you are so if you're interested in beautiful looking plants you probably are just looking at one aspect of uh, nature and not at a holistic view yes you see you see we we are in india which is a land of grasslands and jungles not forests jungles jungle in the sense of the difference between combed hair and shivji ke jata between dreadlocks and combed hair a jungle oh. unkempt it's it's a net a web and the combed hair are all very neat and clean plantations are combed hair and, and jungles are, are dreadlocks that's what the traditional indian interpretation has been shape ji ki chatta so uh, uh, i've lost the thread uh, uh, i've lost the thread i was uh, could you just put me back online you were talking about uh, uh, india as a land of uh, jungles yes. and grasslands yes you see so now what happened is that when the moguls came they brought with them concepts of central asian beauty so the neat little lawn the grassland with flowers studded with flowers that became the ideal the persian formal. formal garden that became the ideal for the outdoors and uh, in fact you know the the the, the carpets are also basically grassland with flowers it's a recreation of that that is not indian now when our parks departments in cities and all they talk about green areas natural spaces but actually what they do they put in exotic plants which they make sure that the insects won't eat birds can't feed on nothing and you have you have um, uh, parks on which a lot of money is spent keep, keeping it artificial so whether you have a, a roof over it or not those are unroofed artificial areas those are not natural areas so we have to allow things to be unkempt things to grow insects to not, not look at insects as creepy uh, things to be avoided isn't it so we have to give them their space we have to give our neighbors their space if it's a green area uh, if a park is a meant as a green lung of the city so uh, just having palm trees and and some ornamental plants doesn't make it doesn't make it that it's still an artificial space we have no. to give 
the ability to grow naturally. And when the birds move in, when the insects move in, then it is a natural space. When it is supporting a population of birds and, and squirrels and whatever, then it is a natural space. And so for I also, I also tell people that this clean Delhi, green Delhi together doesn't make sense at all. This is just a, a, a you know, eye wash. Uh, eventually, uh, it should be separated, uh, not just as a symbolic thing. In people's mind, it should be separated. Uh, people should start finding joy in wilder places, unkept places, because there is some joy in that. It's not, it's not like only uh, manicured lawns look good. It's not actually. It's, Culturally, what you're taught, how you look at outdoor spaces, uh, yes. inclination yes. changes. It's great if yes. we can get more kids to get involved in looking at people, looking at uh, habitats like that. The beauty of a grassland, the beauty of a real jungle. You know? Exactly. Instead of it just having some man eaters, and that's what's exciting because. Uh, exactly, and you see. The, the, when you say that how does a, a, a widespread knowledge of, say, butterflies in the public, how can we make a difference? We can make a difference by influencing our children or people around us. Look, this is not the way things are. Why don't you look at it this way and then let them see things that way too. Basically, the Persian lawn has got away with it for the past 600 years because everybody saw it that way. See, there was nobody to stand up and say, hey, no, this is a terrible thing that's happening. This, this uh, neat green thing with a border and, and some uh, glossy little flowers over there and a couple of palm trees plonked around and a, and a, and a clipped edge. That's not, that's not what we want. And everybody will start thinking that way. This and we were further, further indoctrinated by the British idea of gardens too. As in, in Delhi, most no, no. of the Vista is like destitute. It's... It's trees which are going to be evergreen, and the area has deciduous trees. So yeah, that's the dichotomy. But the English English garden is actually a wild place. This is the the formal garden it's called. Yeah, yeah, the, but not not here. When they brought stuff here, they had a different impression of uh, keeping things the way if they were they were really good uh, botanists. Uh, I must agree. But uh, the way they looked at the landscape was. Uh, uh, Sorry. Sorry. Is an example of that, no? It, no. They learnt formal gardening in India from the Mughals. The Mughals were the gardeners. The British had a very poor idea of plants. That's why they called in a German to set up the forest service. Dietrich Brandes was from the German forest service. The Brits didn't have a forest yeah. service. They, they could get the best people to do their work. Basically, <laughs> they, they have a lot of, uh, uh, they've gotten a lot of trees from across the world to Delhi. Uh, oh, they, uh, and they, neglected the ridge as we call it, it's not even called the Aravlis. We just want to, you know, uh, somehow not even call it a natural space. It's something called the ridge, which, you know, could be ambiguous, could be anything. It's not even in our mindset. People don't even in Delhi realize that we live on the uh, most ancient, uh, you know, fold mountains in the world. So uh, that also goes in with this perception of what is nature and exactly. how exactly. manage it. What is acceptable, what is nice, what feels good. That is up to us to, to tell our kids to give, give a background to. No? So, so we have to change that. And that is what we educated people can do. Once you're studying butterflies, I remember Milin Bakare, uh, when he first met me, he said, I'm into butterflies, what can I do? I suggested, look, we don't know much about the larval host plants in the Western Ghats. So he had an acre of land as a farm where he was uh, keeping cacti. He said, I've, I've got all of them now and I, I want to move to something else. So when some years later, after he got into breeding and you know what he did with the book of the Western Hearts, he went and bred them practically. Yeah. And, but now his, his farm looks like a wild land. You know? It's not the manicured little one acre anymore. <laughs> because once you start breeding butterflies, oh, leave that lantana alone because they feed on it, you know. And so on and so forth. So at Ottoman, if you see our place, you've been to our place. Oh, leave that plant alone, it, that one feeds on it. Oh, leave that one alone, that one feeds on it. So you end up in the forest. You, 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 know, you let it grow back. So that is what the end result of this knowledge base, evolving knowledge base for Indian uh, urban and um, rural people is. Knowledge is power. True, true. And even this example of uh, Melin, sir, like uh, you're saying, he came, he came to you with this idea of doing something and it turned out to a, into a um, big book 
an excellent source of information and now everybody can you know uh, it's the best book on butterflies in the world there is no other book that matches it and uh, t- testimony that uh, citizens come up with it <sighs> citizens come up with everything nobody gave isaac newton a degree exactly it's a, yeah. that's exactly my uh, that's what i was leading up to so how important could citizenry be in uh uh just science as in how have we separated both of them over the years and how it, that needs to be broken down uh one second ankit it's called butterflies of the western ghats um yes um what happened in the 1970s until the 1960s nature studies were anecdotal because that's the only way that you can really communicate a, an entire picture and feeling right oh. and then slowly as computers gained uh, acceptance people wanted to move everything onto a screen so they wanted something that you can measure and then this trend of statistics and so on and so forth came up and nowadays uh, you can't uh, the mainstream scientific journals just like the mainstream media and they have their priorities and among their priorities is that you need to have a lot of um, mathematical analysis in order to justify the simplest stupidest thing uh-huh. so um, they, and they call that science so i don't know and for that reason we now publish a journal called bio notes where we only publish anecdotal findings because we i believe that they are the more important ones uh, if a butterfly came to a particular lantana bush 10 times or 15 butterflies came visited it between 11 o'clock and 2 o'clock it's meaningless it will not happen next year the bush might not be there next year but if we know that 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 uh, the the peak butterfly activity period is at that time of day then a um, 100 years later it will still be valid information so the so uh, actually leads me into my next question peter lots of people have asked uh, uh, about making careers in butterflies or how do you study butterflies people have asked specific questions like can you use gps uh, tagging for studying butterflies so what is the way that people should go about studying butterflies like you're saying anecdotal findings are really important uh, it's in history natural history hmm natural history is hello i think we've got hung no hello. i can hear you i can hear you okay natural history is what i'm talking about natural history is anecdotal mm-hmm. and uh, that is really the way to add information not on by trying to choose cherry pick a few factors and measuring it and then bringing it onto a graph i understand statistically the maximum number of factors you can compare are around 20 but in nature there are very many more that are that are influencing things Absolutely. so uh, which you do you you in making a sentence you actually give a give a, an analysis which can include hundreds of factors in the in the if i say that the sun is shining it means that that uh, photosynthesis is going on it means that there is light it means that there is a certain heat it means so many things when i say the sun is shining but if i want to only give you a temperature at the moment it can also be without the sun shining there still be a temperature isn't it it doesn't say if the sun is shining or not so in that sense oh my god here comes the truck it's going to be a lot of noise yeah so that's the uh, you know that's the problem in this uh, whole uh, new wave of wildlife science of quantifying things you know stats and uh, models being very very important and uh, it like you say it is uh, um, for the citizens to come out and you know break that uh, dichotomy that kind of creates a division between what a normal person can do and what a statistician can do and leads to a place where only statistical science is considered wildlife science whereas anecdotal findings are just dada nani ki kahani ha huh. not the case you see the thing is that we don't we are not setting out to break anything or anything like that please you want to do statistics go ahead and do it not a problem you know somebody is giving you money to go and and dig up some sort of uh, statistics please go ahead and do that it might be useful we are nobody to judge but what we can do is that we won't do it and we will <laughs> add our observations in the scientific literature 
The thing about publishing in a peer-reviewed journal is that it enters the literature and then it is accessible 100 years or 200 years later too. Just like we can go to the, the early volumes of the Bombay Natural History Society 100 years ago or the Journal of the Asiatic Society or something and find out what was going on then. So in the same way, once it's in the scientific literature, it's there. A newspaper report is not a thing. Social media, it, it dies out within a few hours. A newspaper thing dies out within a few days. A magazine will, dies out within a few months. But a peer-reviewed scientific journal will have information which is always accessible. That's the whole idea behind it. So bio notes could be a great place for anybody to start. Yes, yes. It was meant, you see, Dr. Vashni, God bless his soul, he retired from the Zoological Survey of India and he felt that the problem with peer-reviewed uh, journals is that they take too long to process a paper. So uh, a friend recently had a paper published after, I think, three and a half years after submission. I also had that experience. Three and a half years after submission, the finding is ancient. Things have moved on. It's a long time. So he set up this thing called Bio Notes in, in 1999 or 97 or something after his retirement. And uh, it was meant to publish things within three months, small findings by students, right? It, he, it was not peer reviewed at the time. And he just said in three months, we'll put your finding in a, in a scientific journal. And then you can use it in your, in your curriculum vitae or something. It, can, it becomes useful, you see. Otherwise, everything is in press, in press, in press. And by the time you passed out, you still haven't got your, your paper, which you had submitted three years ago. <laughs> so, the, the, so we continue that, but we've got it peer reviewed too. So I try to process the papers as quick as possible and put them out. But we don't deal in statistics unless they are, they are a few statistics and meaningful ones, which are, but not, not your, your uh, major statistical analysis. I don't believe that nature can be pinned down on a screen. I don't believe, you know, you had things like this Pollard walk. Mm. Okay, so what they said is you take a I use it quite often. 100 meter walk, right? And then you walk slowly along it at a fixed rate and you observe everything within five meters and you identify it. And then you make your statistical analysis with it. It works up to a point in a temperate European forest, for example, or North American. But in the tropics, it doesn't work. What's going on on the tree? How can we depend on your identification prowess? You need to hold a specimen in your hand. In some cases, you need to dissect it to know what it is. How can we believe that what you identified is, is valid? You know, I got papers with this Pollard work for review. And they were putting African species there and whatnot because they were beginners. And they said, oh, I said, how can we, I mean, tell me why I should trust what you have stated in the paper. How, how can you convince me that you've seen this African species in Kulu? So oh, we, we've consulted this field guide. Like, that's not the way it happens, Baba. You need proof. Science is all about reliable proof. I can do it. You can do it. He can do it. It's science. I can do it. I can fly in the air. It's yoga. It's valid also. But you see, everybody can't do it. You need to practice. But scientific facts, I, you, he, everybody can, can get the same result. Then it's science. Isn't it? Reliable. So uh, please, I have nothing against yoga. I believe in it. I know that there's all sorts of meditations which you can do a lot of things with. But if Sohail has spent six years practicing, Sohail can do it, but I can't do it. I'll need to practice six years to, to do it. And I'll need to get the same sort of a guide and put in the same effort to do it. So everybody can't do the same thing, isn't it? So uh, nobody's putting anything down. But uh, science is something about where if... So he'll walk down the road, he'll see those butterflies. If I walk down the road, I'll see those butterflies too. Isn't it? Yes, yes. And uh, moving on to the next question that a lot of people have asked and is a vast topic in Indian butterflies is uh, migration. It's baffling because we all know about the monarch uh, the migration. Uh, it fascinates us. And in India also, there's uh, uh, migration of butterflies happening, but not much is known. What are your uh, inputs on it or your thoughts about it? And how we can go about studying migration? And people have also asked that. Even hmm. Rajesh, Rajesh Chaudhary and I have been discussing from our balconies, standing on our balconies, south, southwest. And <laughs> so, so how do you go about doing this? Mm. See... Uh, Ill-understood migration has uh, negative effects also, and I'll explain them. But first of all, you have a butterfly 
just talking about butterflies in particular, not in general, not, not, not uh, life forms in general. In butterflies, you have many species that are very local. Despite being local, only found within a certain area, like the best example is the red piero. Um, but even then, and it, 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 the caterpillar lives inside the succulent leaf and, you know, the butterfly itself hardly flies too much. But uh, despite that, it tends to expand its range. So in, it has expanded its range to North India, Delhi, all over the place. Earlier, it was only known from Peninsula India and Assam. Now it's found as far as, as Jammu, and Kashmir, Jammu and Kashmir, right? So even the, the very local ones want to expand their range. That's what the butterfly stage is all about. You have metamorphosis where the creature lays eggs. The creature lays eggs because it can lay a large number. You see, I'll give you an example. And that is that our grandparents used to have lots of children, 10, 12 children. And um, then our parents, I, I have five siblings. And uh, now we have two children. Two is the accepted thing. So the reason is healthcare. So if, if our grandparents had two children, their neighbors and their relatives would say, please have more children because you know you can get wiped out. And uh, nowadays our healthcare has improved so much that um, we can um, be pretty certain that our children will survive to carry on our lineage. It's all about continuing lineages. So insects lay large number of uh, eggs because they want um, their lineage to continue. So the, that's their thing. That, so they don't give birth to live insects, they give birth to eggs. Then the caterpillar comes out, which feeds on leaves usually. Now, the caterpillar feeds on leaves because leaves have been around for millions of years. You have primitive moths, which don't have mouth parts in the adult stage, right? When they're adults, they can't eat anything because they evolved at a time when there were no flowers and no fruit and no sap. So then there was nothing to eat. So why, why you know, get a mouth part? So the caterpillar stage is to get together the food. And when the insect has got enough food in it, then it wants to convert into a flying insect to find a mate and to spread the eggs. So it makes a pupa and when the conditions are right, then it comes out of that pupa. And for in primitive things like the giant silk moths, the atlas moths, the tassar moths, the female cannot fly until she's fertilized. She'll come out of the cocoon, but she can't fly. She'll expand her wings. But if you, if you throw her in the air, she'll come circling down to earth. She can't flap her wings. She can't fly. But as soon as she is fertilized, she can fly because she has a limited amount of energy. She can't eat anything. So that energy is meant for dispersing the eggs. And the males can fly to locate the females. So the female comes out of the pupa, out of her cocoon and pupa, and she releases a pheromone saying, I'm out. Uh, males are attracted. They mate with her. As soon as she mates, she can fly. Mm -hmm. Now, so the, the females are trying to disperse the, the thing. Every species, everything that has wings, the idea is to disperse. Some of them, in my, what we call a migration, is when a very large number of them disperse together. And they are males and females in those dispersals. Because normally, only the females disperse. The males don't need to disperse too much. So when, what happens is that sometimes there are population outbreaks. Now, an average butterfly lays about 100 eggs, out of which eventually only one female is going to lay eggs to maintain a stable population. But if for some reason the parasites along the way, the egg parasites, the larval parasites, the pupil parasites, and the adult killers, for some reason or the other, they don't, uh, their population is affected, is reduced. So all those 100 insects become adults. That's when you have a population outbreak. And then it is a program for them to spread to new areas because they know that there will not be enough food in that area for everybody to lay eggs right? and, and, and survive. So then you have that, those sort of migrations. Then you have migrations which happen every year, like the pea blue. Every year it migrates. Or in, in the South Indian hills, you have these uh, tigers and, and several species. Every year they migrate. The reasons for that is unknown. So you have a forced migration where there's been a population outbreak and then you know the population is pushing outwards. And then you have the regular migrations. We know that they go in a certain direction, where they come from, where they go to, 
why it happens. We will need very many more inputs from residents, from residents to try and map and figure out what's going on. Even discovering the Monarch story, that was only in the 19, late, mid 1970s that they discovered the valley in Mexico where they all went. They used to see the Monarchs going somewhere every year. Nobody knew about it. And then one guy discovered it and he kept it a secret, but he let it out somehow. And then another guy went and he discovered it. And then he took credit for the whole thing. Uh, the, the guy who originally discovered it didn't get much credit for his discovery. But be that as it may, um, we have a lot of, of things to find out regarding Indian mi migration. And we can do that with a well-informed resident public who give the inputs to say, yes, we saw this swarm in this year, in this year, there were so many in this year, you know, it was more, it was less, it was normal, whatever. And then try and analyze the data. That is where your statisticians can come in. <laughs> now, has a role. now um, I was talking about this had some negative effects as migration. You see, in the, in the, all over India, all over the old world, that is leaving the Americas aside, Africa, Asia, Europe, we have had uh, the pea blue migrating in spring. So billions and billions and billions of them migrate in spring. And um, it's, it's, it's uh, crop pest, the IARI, issues, uh, things, advisories on how to control them, the effects on peas and all that. But it is on Schedule 2 of the Wildlife Protection Act. And why is it on Schedule 2 of the Wildlife Protection Act? It's because in the Andaman Islands it is rare. So, you know, the uh, fair, fair, fair that it's rare, basically. And said, well, it's not a common butterfly here because it doesn't reach here across the sea, only a few reach. So it was included in the Wildlife Protection Act. So, and the, the same goes for the crimson rose. The crimson rose was a swarm, a, a butterfly that swarms. Oh. Yet it's on Schedule 1 of the Wildlife Protection Act. So why is it on Schedule 1 of all things? <laughs> then why? It's not threatened or endangered or whatever in any way. And it turns out that it, only one specimen from the Nicobar, the Andaman Islands, because they tend to fly out in swarms, they fly out to sea. Ah, from from Kerala, from from Tamil Nadu, swarms of crimson rose butterflies fly out to sea, and uh, they they are never seen again. And well, one of them happened to reach the the, the uh, Andaman Islands and be recorded. So in in a book, it is called "Very Rare in the Andaman Islands," and everything that was very rare was put in Schedule One. So the Babus didn't know what they were doing, and now we have the crimson rose, which is an endemic and very very common butterfly on Schedule One of the Wildlife Act. So you know this migration thing also has some some bad effects if it's not understood. <laughs> So basically, this brings out uh, your point very well of uh, how important uh, knowledge is and especially in the hands of citizenry because uh, yes. we can't rely on babus or we can't rely on other people. Uh, let's forget about Sarkar or anything. We can't. It's, uh, I think it's high time we start taking matters in our own hands in the way we can. Especially in terms of knowledge, especially in terms of uh, changing perception of kids around us because you know uh, they're going to inherit the world so if they have a better idea of what to do in this place might be a better place so that is a good way of illustrating how uh, information can lead to change i would definitely agree with that i would definitely agree with that and um, i would add that i said earlier that we citizens are the owners of this country if we don't know about it then we don't deserve to be owners it's as simple as that. If you, if you, is, you know, like ownership is like muscles. Use it or lose it, isn't it? Now, uh, Atanu Bora, what are your full thing didn't include you some, some since Pollard walk something something in northeast in northeast India since Pollard walk is not uh, valid. Well, Atanu, the the uh, valid way to study it would be presence or absence, seasonality. <laughs> Akash, sir, could you mute your mic? Or you could also not mute it and say nice things instead of smoking. Um, <laughs> um, the, the normal way to, to study butterflies is to have lists of what occurs 
and at what seasons they occur. And you can have anecdotal accounts about whether they're common or rare. You, and there's this thing about if you see more than less than five, it's rare. If you see more, more less than 10, it's not rare. You can make things like that. It helps a bit. But it is, it is a purely subjective thing. Because if you, you happen to be there at the right time, you would see a lot of them. And if you came half an hour later, you might not see them. Yeah. I remember, you know, the chocolate pansy. Most of us know about chocolate pansy. There was a chocolate pansy in front of our house and he had been uh, attacked by a bird. So he had a very distinctive section of the wing missing. So in the morning at uh, till 11 or 12, he was around our place and then he disappeared. And I went up on the hill above our house and he was up there oh. for fun. So he shifted up over there. Butterflies are not stable. They don't stay in one. It's not plants. They move. They're highly mobile. So if you, you might count the same butterfly three or four times if you <laughs> I into count, isn't it? So presence or absence is the better thing. And okay, if it is in large quantities, if you actually see 10 parrots peacocks together, then obviously you're seeing them again and again. But in Kurk, for example, I remember I was in Tal Kaveri, the origin of the Kaveri River, and there were these parrots peacocks flying over the canopy. And they, uh, they have fixed paths on which they fly. And then every three minutes or five minutes, this parrot peacock would fly across. It was impossible to tell whether it was the same one going round and round or whether it was different ones following a path. You can't tell. How are you going to tell? So until we know more about it, at the moment, I think the level of our information is where we would say, um, local observation is important in dogma, I say the butterfly population. Yes, definitely. Definitely, I think. So um, I would say just observe and um, uh, uh, a, a major problem, which again, I, I come to nowadays, they say we want research funds. Okay, so you want research funds. So the funders say, well, please come to us with a proposal. So you have to go to them with a proposal saying, look, I want to go and do this and that and do the other. And they say, what are your expected results? So you have to give them your whole expected results. And then what are you going into the field for? If you know what you're going to find, and you're just going to find it and you'll cherry pick those facts which, are, which will support your finding of that particular thing because you got funding because of that. Then to Bekarena, if you go into study butterflies, if you want to go and look at butterflies and understand the butterflies, you or anything, birds or anything, you have to go in with an open mind, an open mind and open eyes and open ears and see what you think and try to understand it. And once you can follow up on that and say, why is this thing happening? Or why is this unusual? Or, you know, why is these birds not come this year? Or why is this butterfly not come around? Why is this happening? Or why is it not happening? From there, you take it forward, isn't it? Yes. You, you, you can't just go with a, with a predetermined, I remember the, the, the Gujarat Forest Department. Uh, yes, one second, Swati. Um, the Gujarat Forest Department, uh, there was a lady from Nasik who was doing a PhD on butterflies and she wanted permission to study the butterflies as a PhD topic of a national park in South Gujarat. So she applied to the wild, chief wildlife warden for permission. So they said, okay, we, uh, thank you for your letter. The reply came from the chief wildlife warden. Um, please give us a list of butterflies you wish to survey for permission. <laughs> So yeah, <laughs> no, you no. Them before the action. So this is this is a bit silly, isn't it? Okay, yeah, now that in, yeah yeah please please go on. Butterfly congregations, right? Um, butterfly congregations. Butterflies carry most of the stuff they need, most of the fuel they need from the caterpillar stage. Hmm. Some some um, Butterflies lack certain chemicals, which they might need for one thing or the other. So in the case of the tigers and crows, it is pyrrolizidine alkaloids. And in the case of the whites, it is some calcium or sodium salts. And um, so, so they lack something which they don't get from the, the caterpillar stage. And then they need to go and look for these things. And where they find, uh, um, what do you call it? Uh, puddles with this or because uh, butterflies have those proboscis, they can only drink liquid food. So where they go and find some liquid that they can suck up with containing these salts or those uh, alkaloids or whatever, then they gather their numbers. And the gatherings are usually of males. Females also visit water, but less and for quenching their thirst. 
but the, the gatherings of hundreds of them, you know, the most usually males. So, Peter, this is the right time. Uh, actually, you've touched upon a question from uh, the participants. So, my uh, thematic questions are over. Now, I'm just going to go through. Uh, there were absolutely a lot of questions. Three questions per person and a lot of registration. So, uh, <coughs> some have been eliminated to this thematic thing, but some are very specific. Uh, like this uh, congregation that you just explained. Somebody asked about mud puddling, which is uh, almost the same thing that you're talking about. Uh, so, let me start off with Sharon's question. Uh, which is quite interesting, uh, if you ask me. He, wa he wants to know, how did the naming of butterflies start? And why some butterflies are named like Joker, Painted Lady, etc. So I think he means about Indian butterflies. Because I've heard an anecdotal story of uh, all the Nawabs and Rajas, uh, you know, sitting on meat or uh, on dog or, or yeah, foul stuff. And that's why they've named like that. So maybe you could clarify. Um, uh, just ask, is Sharon online? Could you ask him if he wants to know about the naming of butterflies, the common names? Or does he mean the scientific names? Common names, I think he means. Common names? Uh, well, the, the thing is that, that um, in Europe, there are fewer insect species and uh, everything, practically everything had its own name. The moths didn't, they were given names later, but butterflies, there were only a handful of them. So they were given their common names. In most European languages, you'll have common names for each Indian, each butterfly species, depending on the habits. Now about the, the earliest uh, records of the common names of uh, English butterflies is from the 1600s where the Painted Lady was already called the Painted Lady. And um, the Admiral, they have the Red Admiral there, was uh, apparently a corruption of Admirable. And uh -huh. uh, now for the Painted Lady, Sarab Sait had observed that there is actually a lady painted on the underside of this butterfly. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a lady in profile sitting in a gown and um, the normal explanation was that um, painted lady is an euphemism for a lady of ill repute. So there was some talk about how it was given because the painted lady is found all over the world, except Antarctica. It's found on all the continents except Antarctica. Although the Australian has now been separated to a species, but uh, earlier it was considered within uh, Kadui. So this is found on all the continents and therefore it's a painted lady. But uh, it turns out that that was before people knew that it's found in all the continents. In the 1600s, people didn't know that it's found in all the continents. So obviously that's not the explanation. Then they said that the, the color, the upper side color, the pink, uh, the salmon color of the upper side markings resembles the rouge that women at that time used to use. And therefore it was you called the painted lady because it looked like a butterfly which had put rouge on. But on, when you look at that, there is actually a lady painted on the hind wing, underside hind wing of the butterfly. Then I think some child observed it and <laughs> pointed it out to his fellows and said, look, there's a painted lady on the wing. And then she, she got the name painted lady. I think that is the most uh, um, um, sensible um, uh, explanation. And as far the rest are concerned, the Indian butterflies were named by uh, Brigadier Evans. He wrote a book in 1927, and in that he coined names for most Indian butterflies that were known, all the butterflies that were known at the time. And um, it was pretty random. So you had uh, in, the, in the sailors, you have sailors that flap and then glide and then flap and glide. So they're called sailors. And... Um, the small ones he called Laskas because he, he played, he played uh, things saying that uh, the sailor is spelled with an E, S-A-I-L-E-R, not the marine, S-A-I-L-O-R. So he called the butterflies S-A-I-L-E-R-S, butterflies that sail. But he called the little orange and black ones Laskas. Laskas were the lowest grade. They used to be the, the people who were shoving 
coal into the into the uh, into the furnaces and the ships. So the little ones were called laskers, and then the bigger ones were called sailors, and then the the big bo bossy type ones were called sergeants, and the even more bossy ones were called commanders, isn't it? So uh, he sort of thing, and then of course there was this whole nobility, royalty, rajas, nawabs, dukes, earls, and all that, and they were he was having his quiet laugh. He was a Welshman. And the Welsh have their own sense of humor. So he was having his quiet laugh when he, when he put the whole nobility. But you see, there's no butterfly called the king or the queen. You have the jungle king and the jungle queen, but not the king and the queen, because that would be blasphemy. If somebody got onto him, then you'd have had trouble. So uh, you don't have a butterfly called the king or the king. You have the palm king, you have the jungle queen, but jungle king, but not the king and the queen. Don't play with that. But everybody else, the earls, the barons, the, the whole nobility. And you see, he was looking for names. When the process of naming, of scientific names started, so after, after a point, the people were naming them. They had hundreds of things to name. So they started looking where to get names in this quantity. So they then went, Linnaeus, of course, he went to uh, Greek mythology. And he, everybody who was figured in the Trojan War, he put the, on butterflies. So you have Helenus, Paris, um, Politus, um, and Retino, Polycto, everybody who was in the Trojan War is a Papilio today. Oh. <laughs> so, and then when they finished with the Greek pantheon, then they moved on to the Indian pantheon, to the Egyptian, to the, all, all the, because they were looking for names, no? Oh. So it's not, it's not very easy to think up uh, large numbers of names. So, okay. um, Peter, yeah. uh, the next question from uh, Sharan is, uh, uh, he sees Jezebels at his home during a, specif during a specific, um, during specific months and in hundreds. Uh, where do they go rest of the year if they are migratory? They die. Butterflies die. They have a two week life. Uh -huh. Tigers live up to two or three months, but most of the others have a two week life. They become dust. So where are they coming from when he sees hundreds of them? Jezebels are poisonous, right? So they do not have much challenge in the egg, caterpillar, pupil stage. You know. Now what happens is that we know how a, a caterpillar wants to transform itself into a butterfly. Yes. Now transform yourself is not an easy process. So what the caterpillar does is it dissolves itself and it rearranges its cells into a butterfly. That process is carried out inside the pupa. If the pupal case was not there like an eggshell, it would dry up and that would be the end of that butterfly. So the caterpillar may, has this pupal case in, which when it sheds the last larval skin, there's a pupal case over there and it attaches itself somewhere, lets the pupal case harden and then it dissolves itself and it forms a butterfly. Now it forms a butterfly in about a week or 10 days or something, sometimes less. And then it waits. It doesn't just emerge. That would be a stupid thing to do because it has a very brief adult life, thing, life uh, period. It can't live for very long as a butterfly. So it waits for a combination of things to happen. Now, what would be the combination of things? The main thing is that the female is looking to lay eggs on her larval host plant and she wants the larval host plant to have buds, not hard mature leaves which the baby caterpillars can't feed on. So the major thing is that the food plant of the butterfly has to have uh, leaves which the young caterpillars can feed on. Now suppose we take April 1st as the date on which a particular plant is going to have buds. So the female wants her caterpillars to be on the plant and out of the eggs on the 1st or by the 5th of April before the leaves harden. So she, taking the 1st of April as a date, she has to lay fertilized eggs at least five days before that because it takes five days for the egg to, for the caterpillar to form inside the egg and break out and come out. That takes us to the 25th of April, uh, of March. Now to 
be able to lay fertilized eggs by the 25th of March, she needs to find mates. So she needs to come out three or four days before that. So she needs to come out on the 20th of March or the 15th or 20th of March to be able to give her children the opportunity to get fresh leaves on the larval host plant. Okay. So she plans that she has to come out on the 20th of March or the 15th of March. Now, how is she going to work that out? The thing that, that works very well for most butterflies is day length because that goes mechanically. It is not subject to the variations of weather. Day length is a fixed thing. So the female waits for a certain day length and the day length comes, but it's still a, a gap. I mean, she has a two week option within that day length period. And uh, in, in the other two factors that count are temperature and humidity, because these two factors are going to determine whether the tree comes in or the plant comes into bud or not. If it's very dry, the plant won't come into bud. And then it's pointless, even if the day, day, day length is correct, it's pointless laying eggs because you won't have the buds. So she is looking at three things, at least basic, temperature, humidity, and day length, to calculate the period for emergence from the pupa. And the males, the males know that they have competition. Now I say no, they know a lot of things. They know that they have competition. So the males usually emerge a few days before the females to lay things out and get ready and make up their beats and decide who's going to be where, who's going to, who's the toughest guy, have their fights, chase out people or whatever. And then they can have their beats ready. So when the females emerge, then the toughest male will have been selected by them. And then they can mate and fertilize the females and then the females can go and lay the eggs. So the mass emergence of butterflies is triggered by these factors. That is fantastic explanation of, uh, you know, if people are looking at these congregations, how they can start thinking like the butterfly and, you know, get to know beforehand if they are observing stuff. If you observe stuff, you can figure out days like you've been counting backwards. You can mm. do something on your own. It's, it's really good. I, yeah, fascinating, uh, Peter. So, Peter, in this vein, there's another question. Uh, uh, you kind of touched on it, but uh, maybe you have a better understanding of it. So, question is, have species been introduced artificially into uh, the environment which they haven't existed before? Please cite an example, Indian or global. So, I think it's the red period here that you were talking about, but uh, maybe you can elaborate. Uh, wait, I'm sorry, there's a truck driving past, so I can't really hear you. Okay, so the so question is, have species been... Peter's video is frozen. Hmm? Peter, Hello. yeah, he's back. Yeah. Is it okay? Peter, yeah, I can hear you. So, I mean, yeah. So the question is: Have species been introduced artificially into an environment which they haven't existed before? Please cite an example. So uh, any species that has been introduced artificially to an environment which wasn't there before. Red period is a great example of this. Peter is not in the meeting. Oh, so am I speaking to myself? Uh, uh, he'll, he'll join back, I think. is frozen. Oh. The truck passed by and so the, it took the network uh, away with him. <laughs> <laughs> the internet went with the truck, so he's trying to get some internet. Okay, so uh, is there any chance of interspecies mating in butterflies? That's the next question. And there have been few examples. If you search online, uh, even Dr. Sur Prakash from JNU had a paper on this. I'm not too sure. But uh, information is easily available online for interspecies mating in butterflies. It does happen. Peter okay. has his own paper on this. Peter, one of the, Peter's earliest paper is on this. Sure, so maybe we can ask him when he comes in. Yes.
I can see Peter in the meeting. Peter is having some error five in his Zoom thing, so he's joining back in a couple of minutes. Yeah, he's joined back. Hi, Peter. Are you here? Peter is here. Correct. So yeah, thanks for the bio break. Okay, can is Peter on? No, Peter is on mute. I've asked him to unmute himself. Maybe I need to call him. Peter is back. Is it on? Is he unmuted? He's gone. Can you hear us? You're muted. He's not there. I think he must be having network. Some issue. error five in Zoom. Tell him to get out and come in again. Yeah, that's what that that's what he is doing. That's what he is doing. In the meanwhile, maybe Shantanu, you can cover this question. What are the basic key for beginners to learn about butterflies? Yeah, it's, uh, just a moment. Let's put down the video. Yeah, for a beginner to learn about butterflies, the first thing that you need to do is observe. Observe butterflies, observe butterfly behavior, where they are found, how big they are, what kind of uh, coloration and designs they have. Probably record it. You have two ways of recording it. One is using a camera like most of us do. Another way is actually maintaining a butterfly journal. Where you can, if you if you maintain a journal, what happens? You draw your own butterfly, then you kind of you know mark out things that you stand out, like a blue blue eye design, or or let's say a black eye itself, or a tail that looks like a head. So that is something that will always help you later when you try and find out what this butterfly is looking at from any of the reference books. So that is how you start, and from there you take off. Peter is back, I think. Back online or just? I just let me enter the room. Anyway, so if you can take a question from Karan Shukla, he asked how to identify native plants. I see a lot of weeds near my house. Mostly they are Mexican poppy weeds and lantana. So far, mm -hmm. I know coat button and lantana are excellent magnet for butterflies, but they are not native to India. So how do you identify native weeds that are good for butterflies? So the question, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, uh, lantana is non-native, but it's a good nectar plant. For yeah, same, same with coat button. Yeah, sure. so nectar plants, uh, there are a lot of nectar plants which are native. Uh, if you uh, actually look for them. So, Karan, I think you're in Delhi, if I'm not wrong. So, Aravli has a lot of uh, Aravli species. Uh, most of them are flowering, but they're not as beautiful and as, uh, you know, uh, widely accepted as nectar plants. So, and they're not uh, flowering for a very long period of time. So people don't know about them. But if you 
uh, any caper bush, be it Kanthari or uh, maybe even Gravia tanex, uh, they're, they're profusely flowering plants in native varieties also. So you just have to get to know the native varieties. In Delhi, we are between uh, uh, on the confluence of Aravli and Yamuna. So we have two major type of uh, variations. One is the Aravli plants and one is Yamuna plants. So anything that grows in these has naturally been growing in these uh, areas is native to Delhi. That's how you get to know. There are lots of native plants which are flowering. It's just getting to know the plants. So lantana, that's why lots of people are using because birds like it, butterflies like it, uh, spreads very easily, doesn't die. So, yeah, it's a choice you have to make consciously of knowing these plants. Hope I answer your question. Uh, Peter's phone is still on the blink. Uh, there's some major technical problem. He is trying his level best to come on in. Uh, not happening so so well. If you could kindly take up questions on butterfly habitats, maybe from the question list submitted. Okay, so I'll take specific questions. It's not about habitat. Uh, each like I believe somebody asked that if they can make a butterfly habitat on the seventeenth floor of a building, on somebody asking they can make a butterfly habitat in the second floor of the building. See, uh, second, of floor, second floor, fourth floor, sixteenth floor, fourteenth floor. I've heard a lot of stories. I know a lot of people who are uh, who have their terrace garden. Uh, so I would say yes, you can. Mm, why not? We'll try it out and see if you don't get butterflies. We'll know that they don't go to the 32nd floor in Delhi. But who knows? I, I know of people who have done it on 18th floor, 16th floor in Delhi, in Mumbai. So it shouldn't be a problem. Next question is, each species of butterfly have multiple larval host plants. Will the same larva feed on two different host plants in their life cycle? Let's presume they are placed manually on two different host plants during the life cycle. Yeah, I think Peter, so. Are you, I think Peter is here. Peter, are you there? Any story, please continue. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I've tried it out with uh, um, a Mormon butterfly where they do adapt to uh, newer uh, or supplied host plants. So, for, for example, uh, it started feeding on kadi patta and uh, then you run out of kadi patta. In most cases, if you're feeding it uh, uh, bale patta or uh, lime citrus, in most cases, it will take it on. But there's no guarantee. Sometimes the caterpillar is very finicky. Is doing lots of stuff that we don't know about. So in most cases, it does take over, take on the. Which are the best plants to attract butterflies in my garden? The best plants. So basically, uh, if you ask me for a butterfly garden, there are three things that you really have to do. One, you have to know uh, uh, the butterflies of your area. Uh, there are lots of in resources on the internet where you can find out the specific host plants for these butterflies. Once you have this list down, uh, you have to keep some flowering plants uh, as nectar plants and the rest uh, use that list to populate your garden with a lot of LHPs. And uh, when you're at it, two things to remember, like Peter said, Caterpillars are going to eat your leaves, so no use of poisons like pesticides, insecticides to kill any sort of insects. Second, to leave some areas wild, not have a manicured garden, not do too much deweeding, uh, not cut, uh, like prune your trees too much. Uh, if you practice these, uh, uh, these few things, then, like Peter said, every place will turn into a butterfly. Names of basic host and nectar plants that can be grown on roof gardens. Uh, this is related to the last question itself. Uh, let me give you out some names. So, Madar or Auk, Calatropis procera uh, is good for plain tigers. Kadi Patta is good for Mormon. Uh, citrus fruits are good for nimbu uh, lime butterfly uh, if you like peter's talking about uh, red pyro 
for red piro you can have succulents like patthar chatta or kalincho uh these are a few very common local plants that you can have well, even castor is one of them uh, castor butterfly uh, feeds on the leaves of castor plant and uh, this is how uh, most of the relationships are so in your area if you find a coast plant to be very common it's one of the best to be planted in your garden which flowers i should keep in my balcony for butterflies to come so uh, butterflies visit almost all sorts of flowers uh so just having flowers would be very helpful for butterflies uh if you want specific lists uh there's a new book on butterflies of bangalore which has a good list of uh, nectar plants uh which plants to grow to attract butterflies is making butterfly gardens in houses in western ghat areas a good environmental practice why not yeah, if you're not using poisons and you're not uh, create getting uh, you know non native trees to the uh, habitat then it's a great thing and it's a good environmental practice also if you can actually make a biodiverse garden and a butterfly garden like peter was insisting we we'll also have birds we we'll also have lizards it needs you have a whole lot of biodiversity you can't just have a garden which has uh, uh just butterflies like uh, i tell uh, lots of my students that uh, when red vented bulbul comes to in my garden when red vented bulbul comes closer to my host plants is actually the time i start searching for caterpillars you can find they help me find caterpillars on my plants better than i can do myself so uh it's a good environment but it's what are different kind of trees in which butterfly feed so this has been covered a lot host plants uh, there's a specific larval host plant for uh, most butterflies or uh, a group of a uh, family of trees or plants that they feed on how many butterfly how much can a butterfly garden help as habitat for butterflies and the necessary, necessary ingredients apart from host plants that you said like i said host plant first knowledge of butterflies local butterflies host plants nectar plants poison free and uh, uh, less work for the gardener if you're making your molly or yourself as a gardener doing less work is best for your uh, butterfly habitat uh so well yeah i think sammelan is here in this group itself so he might be having some some thoughts about butterfly gardening to share with the group oh yeah absolutely yeah if sammelan if sammelan you can if you can unmute yourself uh are you able to hear me perfectly yes yes, yes. yeah so sammelan the question is basically about how a commoner like me or somebody like a beginner they can you know make butterfly gardens a small butterfly habitats where butterflies will be attracted is it like laying out a buffet for food and waiting for the butterflies to come in or can we take some measures to make sure we put in butterflies so how does it work a butterfly habitat can be created anywhere uh, as uh, you are already discussing uh, right from the top floor maybe uh, at the 20th floor or the 30th floor uh, i have seen uh, people putting kalanche pinnata plant that is bryophyllum uh, and the red pieros uh, go all the way to that height so um, normally you see uh, you know red pier is flying in a ground level so it's not that uh, the butterflies oh, oh, you know won't come anywhere so they can come anywhere you have to just create a habitat and um, uh, i would uh, suggest you people to put na more native plants uh, rather than putting any exotic um, yeah, somebody were someone were asking like what are the host plants they can put host plants the very common ones the lime plants the curry leaf the false ashoka the cinnamon dalchini uh, that can attract the cinnamon can attract uh, common blue bottle common mine or uh, the michaelia champaka the champak tree can attract the common jute so these are these are the very common plants what you can put in your home gardens and uh, initially you, you can focus on the nectar plant so you can put more of a nectar plant maybe the ixora 
or uh, the statutory petal also the, also the ornamental lantana so if you think that the lantanas are very invasive then uh, in your place uh, here if you put lantana actually we have lantanas naturally but that they are not that invasive like the floss flowers what you see so but you can still put uh, the ornamental lantanas uh, which actually are not invasive which doesn't produce seeds at all so there is no question of them being uh, propagated outside the area where you are put uh, so what happens when in the wild lantanas the seeds are uh, consumed by the birds and they disperse it somewhere else and it might lead to destruction of some habitats nearby so if you go for ornamental lantanas ornamental lantanas would also attract a lot of butterflies in your area and they also flower throughout the year another thing you can focus is that the plants which flower throughout the year like ixora also they flower throughout the year uh, if i am talking about south uh, then you have clerodendron viscosa uh, which is, which are seasonal flowers which are favorite of many butterflies even the clerodendron paniculatum Uh, the pagoda flowers is also right from the smaller hesperidae to the biggest solitaires get attracted to the uh, clerodendron paniculatum you can put hibiscus also hibiscus attracts even the smaller skippers to the solitaires uh, all this almost all solitaires get attracted to hibiscus especially the traditional one the red hibiscus so this is how you can uh, you know also attract butterflies in your home gardens even a window sill will attract butterflies you just put two three lime plants in the window sill you'll see the common normal lime solitaires coming there for laying eggs that's true samelan i think uh, i think from uh, uh, your experience i think the uh, important thing to be, i was also surprised when i uh, first noticed is when i was started to do my gardening but how territorial these butterflies really are if you do put a host plant the right host plant they will definitely come as in uh, uh, i have in my own personal experience really been surprised by the fact that you put a butterfly plant there it is the mormon comes right there so so i think that's an important point to stress on right you found that in your experience too yeah of course uh, butterflies would come anywhere uh, so I, i if if i'm just suggesting someone to go for a full fledged butterfly habitat so what you have to initially do is you have to document the butterflies in that particular area uh, so ne- that nectar plants what you put initially would attract almost all species of butterflies you can do a documentation of the butterflies and accordingly you can plan your host plant so there are a lot of literature available what are the which are the host plant for which butterflies so accordingly you can uh, plant the host plant later on i'm just talking about the full fledged butterfly park if uh, somebody is interested and it is also an earning uh, you know you might not earn in the initial days but it's also an entrepreneurship i would say uh, you can uh, you know you can uh, educate people about butterflies by this conservation model what you create the habitat you create and uh, for that you can also charge them so you it has to be a sustainable one uh, so there are not much butterfly parks in india uh no, it's not necessarily that government has to support for these projects so you yourself uh you have, you have you have a passion you have an interest you can yourself start the, your own butterfly park and that can earn a livelihood for you so melan this is exactly actually a question role of butterfly parks in conservation is it really effective so you no actually you know it's not a one man's job if i do a conservation uh, park at my area it's it doesn't it, it's not going to do anything uh, but uh, it is just to inspire people to uh, conserve the natural forest in their location exactly what i was getting at sammelan so uh, yeah. the role of butterfly parks is not just having host plants is actually the second part you mentioned uh, which is more important that it gives you a place where you can educate aware get and of course as campaigns going on involve kids you know we don't have such spaces so to get to see a butterfly you like i live in delhi most places uh, are uh, residential colonies put uh, poisons in our garden they tv eat the garden there hardly any butterflies that you get to see in a urban environment if it's not properly kept uh, yeah. if we have such parks it's a great place for especially for kids to get into it so i think yes. that's really important that you touched on the role of butterfly parks in terms of educating the people this is to educate and this is how for them to, to give you an experience how the butterflies thrive in the natural ecosystem uh, they get to learn about it when they see that Mm-hmm. True. True. 
Uh, the question for both of you, once again, for people who are new to butterfly gardening and butterfly habitats, is how many quantities of plants do they need to plant? But the, how many host plants do they need to plant? How many, you know, next thing they need to plant to get butterflies on? One plant to each, will it happen? You can, uh, pl- whenever you put a nectar plant, uh, see to that you put them in a row because the butterflies don't ch- change their flower in between when they nectar. It doesn't that it comes on pagoda flowers once, suddenly it comes on ixora. So if it is going on pagoda, it will continuously go on pagoda for some time. So if you have a row of uh, pagoda flowers planted, the butterflies will be there for some time because you have enough source there. So you put it in a row, uh, it should be in a bush, uh, in a patch, uh, create patches of the nectar plants. Uh, and uh, as I said earlier, as far as the host plant is concerned, uh, you can uh, plant it later on. Because you can, of course, plant the very common ones, the lime or the kadipata or the cinnamon or the champak. But if you want to go for a full-fledged butterfly habitat, then you will have to, that's what I said earlier, you will have to make a list of the butterflies found in the area. Accordingly, you plan your host plants. Don't put a, pl- a plant where there is no butterfly coming. So if you put Parsonsia spiral, is for a Malabar tree nymph and it, it doesn't see it in area, it's of no use. Of course, there are crows which might lay eggs on that. So you will have to focus on the butterflies which found in the area and accordingly you have to plan your host plant. What are the host plants you are going to put? Yeah, my answer uh, is exactly right, Samuel. My answer to this would be uh, as much as uh, diversity of plant species are in a butterfly garden, the more diversity of butterflies that you are going to see. So uh, you can start off with one. Of course, you will see uh, uh, butterflies coming on, but uh, making such patches really helps uh, uh, the butterfly population and you'll see more butterfly. That's just the difference. I hope that answers the question, Shantan. Uh, yes, I think the question gets answered. And I don't think Sir Peter is going to join back uh, because his phone apparently has crashed now. So okay. if you want to take any more questions, so well, fine. Otherwise, I think we can wrap up. I think most of the questions were covered. Uh, by Peter, uh, especially on these big teams, there were some pointed questions left. Uh, maybe how many species of butterflies coexist together in Delhi? We have a list of about 100, 101 uh, confirmed. Right, Chandanu? Yeah, yeah. And there is also a question by th- I think Akash Gulalia, sir, about uh, status of list of butterflies in Delhi. What is the status? There is a list of butterflies that has been recorded 102, I think. Shantanu's edition was the uh, last one. Grass start, I think. Shantanu, right? Yes. Yes. So that was the last addition to the list. Uh, there's also a list of 116, 117, I, I think, uh, butterflies uh, by Dr. Sumit Dokia and his yes. students. But I can't, I can't vouch for that. They have it provided evidence of the butterflies they've seen there. So uh, that's about it. It's, we are waiting for somebody to write a paper. Uh, like uh, uh, Peter said that if bio, oh, Peter is coming, if bio notes can be used to publish such data, it would be a great addition to uh, people in Delhi knowing the list so of So any, any book on uh, butterflies in Bangalore? My daughter is in ISC. So, yes, the new book yeah, and, on butterflies yeah. on Bangalore just released a few months back uh, okay. by Krishna Me Kunte. Krishna Me Kunte? Yeah, from NCBS. Okay. Yeah, so, I can book. get it on the net or I get it from your uh, Asola? No, you can mm-hmm. get it from, uh, uh, you can get it online. Uh, I think it's out on Amazon. Butterflies of Bangalore by Krishna Me Kunte. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi guys, this is Harry Sai. Uh, I just released a book on Mukteshwar, nature and uh, bird photography. And I've also included some butterflies there. That's a good thing. I'll put the link over here in case somebody wants to download it, he's most welcome. Oh yeah, yeah. That's uh, a, congratulations. That's Harry, Harry I've been through your book. It is like a really great book which takes you to Mukteshwar in more yeah. ways than one. <laughs> and I had a feeling that I was visiting the place along with you, which is a very good achievement as an author. Please keep up the good work. And even if there are, there are uh, you know, people writing in also in the chat box saying that it's a fantastic book. 
So if you would kindly share the link, it would be great. Yeah, I put the link here, and it's had a uh, superb uh, response, and I'm very grateful to everybody. Uh, I never expected it. Uh, we've got about. Uh, I've been doing nothing for the last three days, but responding to people's WhatsApp and email. Uh, and I am a first-time author, but I've been doing photography for a long time. So I put a few butterflies also just to give a uh, variation. But thank you everybody for a fantastic response. It's really been viral and it surprised me totally. Yeah, I think it's a good thing. Uh, in our big butterfly month last time, there was a big contingent of uh, nature guides from Mukteshwar. So I would love to share uh, this link with them. So they could also, you know, uh, uh, it will be helpful to them because they're from the area and doing uh, running tours and taking people out uh, in the forest, uh, butterflying, birds, as a local initiative. So I think that it will be really helpful to them. So thank you for sharing this it's here. It's totally free of cost and all the hotels and everybody have been requesting for it and I've been passing it on so Wonderful. that everybody can use it. And there are about, uh, about 100 birds on that, so that uh, we can, anybody who visits at least he knows what he can see and do over here. True, true. Exactly. So thank you. I thank guess. you. Thank you very much. Uh, Shandru, and I the think... forward is by Peter, by the way. Oh, okay. okay. He's put in a fantastic uh, forward. It surprised me. I just spoke to him once and he gave a fantastic forward. I can never forget his kindness. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Shadunu, I don't think uh, Puja is coming back. No, he's still having the error code 5. He just messaged me. Okay. So I think uh, we are wrapping it up now because it's almost uh, 6 o'clock. Yeah. So I have a small question. This yes. is... Uh, I'm Charavanan. I'm from Salem. Yes, Mr. Yeah. Charavanan. Most welcome. Tell me. Yeah. Uh, see, I have come across some articles reading about uh, the insect repelling properties on marigold and how is the impact with butterflies and marigold. I just wanted to know about your expert opinion on that. So, uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, butterflies go nectaring on the desi ganda and not the hybrid ones. Uh, okay. so but it doesn't repel, mostly it doesn't repel uh, butterflies. If it's the desi ganda. Okay. The hybrid ones, I have visited a few places where I have never seen any insect or anything in that area. So I just okay. wanted to clarify it. Yes, Thank yes, you. That's, uh, I, I, uh, yeah. It is all I'm about the quality, quality of nectar. The hybrid one has got less nectar. It's same like the rose. And number two, there is butterfly is uh, not, uh, do not use marigold as a host plant. It uses this as a nectaring plant. You would probably find bigger butterflies on marigold, which has got a longer proboscis than any other because uh, the, the nectar in the, uh, uh, I, this uh, genda, it is quite inside. So only big butterflies will visit out there and it will not be repelled by the so-called repellent uh, properties of genda, which has got essential oils, which kind of gives the smell to it. So some blues also plant, visited. Some blues with long proboscis also visited. Yes, but uh, planting a big garden full of uh, gendas will not get you very many butterflies. That's what they have noticed. Yeah, actually, it is now very much commercially planted, and uh, a lot of pesticides I was very much used. concerned about the toxicity uh, in that, which uh, it has a repellent property. So I was just wondering. No, the how it the was pesticide going. is used for the commercial genda cultivation because genda is affected by moths. There are a lot of moths in that, okay. and that uh, that kind of keeps everything away from it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shravan. And it goes uh, exactly the same for nectar plants also. Uh, if you have a lot of variety of uh, larval host plants, I think you should not go for a singular flower, singular like monoculture of flowers. You should go for a variety of different sort of flowers because different butterflies have different length of their proboscis and they're attracted to different uh, flowers. So you know this by experience itself and of course knowledge of uh, your local butterflies. I think people is bad or not.
I think he's still having that error. So Shantanu, he's trying to join, he's, but uh, he's not able to join because I. No, he will not be able times. to join. There, there is a problem out there. So I think we should wind up by now. If there are no more questions. Ah, uh, there are some questions in the chat box. So we need to take that. Please tell us. Okay. Just wait. Now I think the chat box questions have been taken up. Would you get my question answered from Peter Rajesh Verma Dasi? Hello. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Hello, hello. Peter. Hello. Yeah. Hi, hello, Peter. Peter. Hi. Welcome back. Yes, it yeah. seems working now. We missed you. Yeah. 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 Hopefully, we'll get all the other fifty people who have left to come back now that you're back. Hello. Yeah, you're audible. Hello, Peter. Hello. I can Hello. hear you, Peter. Hello. Peter, I can hear you. Can you hear us? Rajesh Verma Dasi, I don't have. The question here. Uh, the the question is in the the question is in the Excel sheet. He will be having questions in the Excel sheet. I know, but I can't see it. Is what I'm saying. Just a moment. Okay. Anyways, do you I want me to read the questions? Or not, Mr. Madhati? Yeah, please. Ah, uh, maybe we can. Okay. The first them. question. The first question. Yes, it has been addressed. It is that have species been introduced artificially into environment which they haven't existed before? Okay. That has been tackled. Second is each species of butterflies have multiple larval host plants. Will same larva feed on two different host plants in the life cycle? Let's presume yeah. they are placed manually on two different host plants during their life cycle. Yeah. Done. Is there any chance of uh, interspecies mating in butterflies? Correct. I think most of the questions were covered. We'll specifically, uh, Rajesh sir, we we'll specifically send this question to Peter and uh, try and get them answered. Right? Are there any other questions in the? No. Uh, Akash Gulaliya sir has got his hand raised. Yes, Akash sir. Akash sir, can you ask your question? Hello, am I audible? Yes, sir. Uh, this is not a question. I just want to share because it's a long time since we have met. The yeah. garden which we developed in uh, DDA Park has become very big. In the sense, we have covered nearly half the area now. Mm -hmm. uh, we with a small patch now that whole park has been slowly converted into a butterfly garden we have number of uh, uh, you know native species coming up and i hope that by july you and uh, others should visit and yes. how it is blooming and there is a demand from one more park in my area uh, people are now Uh, they have actually they have seen some uh, this summers before the summers in the March when there was no lockdown. I took some people there and they saw a lot of castors and you know uh, um, uh, these uh, uh, plain tigers and all this uh, in huge whole number huge numbers. They have come castor one whole uh, this thing they have built of castor you know carry. So uh, so we have to start this work after. Uh, this thing, you know. Yeah, yeah. So uh, just to give everybody context, it is wonderful to hear, Agar sir, that uh, the garden that got started, I think, two years back, two thousand. Yeah. yeah two two. Uh, this is part of, uh, for everybody's information, this is part of <coughs> a, <coughs> a citizen science project called the, <coughs> sorry, called the uh, Delhi Butterfly Corridor, where we are where we're trying to make uh, distributed habitats. across delhi with the aim to 
connect the forests that lie in the south of delhi where i work asola bhati to uh, forests that lie in the north of delhi kamla nehru ridge and beyond wazirapur wazirapur wazirpur band and those areas through <clears throat> east and west connection so this is like an actual corridor we're working on and a lot of uh, uh, about 50 odd parks have been made 55 now have been made uh, across delhi mostly in south delhi so we are looking for people in west delhi or north delhi to come up and uh, maybe we can make uh, butterfly habitats they're where they're very like akash sir there are great examples of uh, uh people who have come forward to take responsibility to create such habitats and uh, with a little bit of help and a change of mindset uh, great things can be done so akash sir thank you thank you so much for uh, sharing this information it gives me a uh, hope and i hope and hopefully everybody else also no uh, so hey, you remember in, when we were establishing it there was a lot of resistance from dda because this yeah. is not uh, This is their domain, and they have a horticulture view of everything, you know. Exactly. So completely changed, and the deputy director himself has called me twice during the lockdown. कि अब आप आइए और पौधे बताइए. That's fantastic to hear, uh, Peter sir. The uh, uh, sorry, Akash sir. That is fantastic to hear because mostly that is what we have to change: the mindset of DDA, of people visiting the park, of uh, our RWAs, of the government if we have correct information uh solid information based on evidence we can go about uh, changing these mindsets and once we do something on the ground like you said that when we were building it initially there was so much resistance they didn't even want to be associated with the plants they were like ye jungli hai ye to acche nahi hai ye kaise laaye ho and all that but uh, once they see effort put by citizens and they see the butterflies there i think uh, everybody got sucked on so this is a thank you this is a great uh, piece yeah. of information you shared and uh, uh, i think it should motivate a lot of people here so everybody anybody who wants to make habitats can get in touch with uh, shantanu or akash sir or me and uh, we can help you out with any help you might require but uh, you have to take responsibility of your area you have to be the guardian and you will join the 55 50 plus people who are already heading such habitats there are lots of examples of people in the room uh, i won't be naming them but uh, uh, you guys know who you are so thank you for your support uh, shantanu let's wrap it up here before we run into run over time and uh, uh, because peter is not coming in let's have you do a vote of thanks and uh, Uh, maybe tell people how they can find your book yeah. yeah in the meanwhile sohel i would request you to put down your email id and your phone number in the chat box so people who are into the habitats or want to get any help regarding the habitat part of it uh, anywhere can get in touch with you based on your experience i'm sure you're going to be able uh, able to help a lot of people i have asked geeta also to try and share the screen if possible with the phone numbers sure so i am uh, uh, sharing my phone number and people can if they want can note that down or save it or whatever and please feel free to call me uh, i'll try and help you with any sort of questions you have for uh, plant selection or any uh, any questions you might have for creating butterfly habitats yeah i think the slide is up geeta ji full screen kar dijiye please these are the good old times when uh, peter used to come down for uh, the big butterfly month uh yeah in the bottom you can see uh, my email id and my phone number and on the top you can see a great group of delhi butterflies dedicated from seniors like peter agas sir to uh, young students like shubham kanan is not here but yeah so uh please feel free to contact me like i said uh, with that uh, shantanu over to yeah, you yeah yeah i i would like to take this opportunity right now to thank uh, each and every one of you for joining today's program it was a great interactive session from everybody i hope everybody is going back with something something with their mind something to do about something to do about it 
and we hope to have uh, you know programs like this in future with the big butterfly month coming up in the month of september 2021 these kind of programs will keep on increasing and uh, i would like to thank peter for his in, uh, contribution in this program and always for the cause of butterflies he is the reason that many of us got into butterflies his book is one of the first books that i have used for in my butterflying i would uh, yes like to thank sohel a very well conducted program very nicely taken about and he has taken questions a lot of questions and volunteered help in butterfly habitat building which is basically hope for butterflies there will be a lot more butterflies that we will be able to see if the habitats are there so i request each one of one of you to put up a small habitat anywhere you want to i think sohel has made a 2 feet by 2 feet habitat in his car parking so that, that is the smallest size yes yes yeah. it has it has recorded i have recorded over nine species of butterflies it's just uh, and it's a interesting story let me just take 30 seconds uh, uh, they were in delhi they have this habit of choking trees they put cement around them so i took my time removing the tiles with cement and made a space under the tree itself and created a butterfly park there and sdmc the municipal corporation came to me and said that uh, this is illegal you can't do this here uh, you're taking up space and i had to tell them that what you have done as an organization as a municipal corporation is illegal in delhi you can't choke trees you can't put uh, cement all across them so even when you're going about doing good things people will come to you and say ki uh, we will find you and we'll do all that so uh, please be ready for all such situations but no for a fact that you are on the side of the law you are uh, on the side of uh, the truth and the facts because everything that you're doing is based on uh, evidence and it's uh, going to help the butterflies actually so uh, that that's what i want to add to that 2 by 2 by it's actually 2 by 3 feet <laughs> yeah <laughs> thank you uh, shantanu for bringing it up so so this this also kind of answers people's questions on i have a small place in my veranda backyard terrace can i make a butterfly habitat yes of course you can you just need to you just need to welcome butterflies to your home and they will be there uh, i would also like to thank nikhil devasar for all his support for this program uh, i think he's there in, out here and again thank you nikhil thank you so much and uh, sammel and shetty Samir and Shetty, thanks uh, for share, stepping in and sharing your knowledge. That's a beautiful park that you have, and 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 a beautiful movie that you have made about the life of butterflies. Uh, some parts of which you shared yesterday also. I hope more such parks are built up. So on one hand, we are talking about huge parks, well, huge beautiful parks like what Samir has built out there, what Suvel has built in Asola and stuff like that. On the other hand, we are talking about small places of butterflies, like in our house, in our terrace. these all contribute uh, to making this butterfly corridor where butterflies can go from one place to another and not be cut off by a street or a house or some factories or something they can move about and that will make it even better for them in the future that being said and uh, i would like to conclude this session for today and we will keep you posted whoever has got their email ids in that excel sheet the form i will send over the link for the book the rest links i have already posted up there and in case uh, you can put a mail across to me i have put in my email id it is the world of shan t h e the w o r l d world o f o s h a n shan at gmail.com and i'll send you the download link for the book happy butterfly bye bye thank you so much thank you everybody thank you geeta thank you everybody thank you shan thank you geeta thank you nikhil thank you all right. bye bye bye